Sure. Um, I just wanted to um, say hi to everybody. And uh, I would like to share a little bit more of history, um, history that, you know, those in Clayton have, um, I think, been attracted to. They're surrounding uh, issues like the World's Fair, um, you know, the trolley that came through the country club. Um, and this was um, something that I looked into during a presentation in a neighborhood. So it was surrounding um, the Skinker Heights neighborhood was the presentation. And I'll just kind of share, share my screen here. And, uh, um, and kind of talk about this, this brief history that I, I had put together for the group to kind of share some of this. Um, but it is surrounding um, some troublesome figures that we had, uh, you know, addressed at the last meeting. Um, you know, the, the figure that we'll highlight the most is Thomas Skinker. The neighborhood is named after him and his family. Um, he was born in Virginia. Um, some of you all who, who are, you know, Katie may be familiar with Fock Weir, you know, that's over there on the um, east side of Clayton you see, recognize it as a street name today. But it was, that street was named, of course, after the county where Thomas Skinker was from and where he brought that tradition of enslaving um, uh, people to here in Missouri. Um, he was an attorney by trade, but he also farmed. His first wife died, um, but then when he remarried, he um, was a plantation owner. Uh, he moved to a plantation in Mississippi um, until they were forced to move again for, um, uh, due to have a change in climate for her health. And so they uh, came to Missouri. Um, so they um, went out to the country, of course. They bypassed the city of St. Louis um, and moved a little farther west and settled probably more and more in the open air where his wife could be a little bit more comfortable um, and breathe a little easier. Uh, but they settled, as I pointed out before, and looking at the map, you'll see the Skinker Farm shaded in yellow. Um, and we'll talk about where their estate was located. But you'll see their farm reached into what is now Forest Park. Um, there was a little bit of controversy over that when Forest Park was established. Thomas Skinker fought that vehemently. Uh, he did not agree with the establishment of Forest Park. Um, because it would have taken some of his farmland. Of course, he was compensated for the land that was taken, but he was um, uh, upset that uh, his land was being taken from him. But anyway, that's another topic. Um, Skinker, though, did build his home on that farm. Um, it's, he named it Ellenwood. Uh, he named it Ellenwood after a daughter that had died in infancy. Um, and because of his tradition of living in Mississippi, owning plantations, we can consider his naming of Ellenwood, the naming of his home estate, because it was his big house. It was his plantation home. Um, and it would have been seen as that. He built it in a um, you know, Greek revival style, a style popular among Southern plantations, um, similar to the Hanley House, how the Hanley House is built in a similar Greek revival style. It no longer stands today because it burnt down um, during the Skinker's lifetime. They had a fire in the house. Um, they actually had a fire while they had a party. It was very dramatic. Somebody approaching in a carriage saw the smoke and flames coming out from an upper window. And everybody at the party grabbed a piece of furniture and, you know, ran out of the house. And they saved as much as they could. Um, but the house itself was a loss. Um, Skinker, of course, because of he was a slave owner, um, even though he did not make his allegiance to the Confederacy known publicly, he did not shout it from the rooftops. None of the none of these landowners in Clayton did. Um, they were all very secretive of their support of the Confederacy. But he, along with many others in um, St. Louis County and specifically in what is Clayton today, um, were made to sign an oath of loyalty to the Union following the end of the war, um, which he did and is on record. Um, but uh, Skinker had some difficulties after his, you know, his home burnt down um, and after the Civil War. As I said, he did have some difficulties with um, 
uh, his land um, being taken um, on the, you know, um, part of his property for this forest park. He filed two appeals to the state Supreme Court, but he eventually lost that fight and the park was established. And it's said that the reason the dividing line, and again, this is not, I don't have evidence for this, it's just something that's been said, that the dividing line um, went for the St. Louis County and St. Louis City um, because it's in an odd position, it's off Skinker Road, it's not exactly aligned with Skinker Road. It said that dividing line was put in place because it ran through Skinker's home, and which would make his life a little bit more difficult. Um, and Skinker would say that he could go to sleep one night in St. Louis County and roll over and wake up the next morning in the city. So anyway, that's just a, a piece of history they like to tell. But um, this dividing line that bisected Skinker's farm, um, you can see it a little bit more clearly here. In the map itself, it looks like that line actually did not run through Skinker's home, which you can see his home highlighted by um, this, um, uh, this square that you see here, and you can see the dividing line. So it was just a story that Skinker told, again, to show that he was hurt and by the decision um, to take some of his farmland. I'm sure it was just propaganda on his part to be more sympathetic or to re get more sympathy. Um, but we can see that property there. Um, and you can also see how um, the Rock Island Railway um, came through um, Clayton um, uh, here on this map. Okay. Um, but as we mentioned, uh, the last, as you guys probably know, you know, Ralph Clayton and the Hanleys um, gave property to locate the county seat. And um, when that happened, we see um, soon after that happened and after the, the court, the courthouse was established, the country club moved to its location just south of the county seat um, in uh, 1896. So we see an image of the clubhouse here. Um, again, we have another, um, uh, another building that suffered due to fire. It burned to the ground in 1897, um, but it was rebuilt. Um, so the clubhouse um, for the St. Louis Country Club, there were two different clubhouses um, over that time it was located um, in Clayton, just south of the county courthouse. Um, and you can see here on this map where um, uh, we have, um, so that we have this North and South Road, we have um, the courthouse, or the courthouse, I'm sorry, the country club property located here. Today it's the Polo neighborhood and the Davis Place neighborhood um, make up what was once the country club. But the reason I'm mentioning the country club, because the country club is really a driving force um, behind um, what Thomas Skinker and his neighbors um, would soon form. They formed this um, Clayton and Forest Park Railway Company because they wanted to bring an electric trolley line to Clayton um, with the country club, as knowing that they, the country club was going to be established as well. Um, so Wydown Boulevard um, would be built alongside that trolley line. Um, the reason for that being that those who would visit the country club, the members of the country club, would never take the trolley. They would take private carriages. Um, and so they needed their own boulevard. They needed their own fine road um, that they could travel on when going from the city of St. Louis out to the St. Louis Country Club um, located in Clayton. But the trolley did run between, um, down the middle of Wydown to carry those that would work in Clayton or work at the country club or those that um, needed the public transportation for um, county business. So Thomas Skinker, um, his son uh, married um, uh, this Southern Belle by all accounts. Her name was Bertha. They settled on the family's Ellenwood estate. And the reason they named White on Boulevard received its name is because it's named after Bertha's mother, um, Isabella Wydown. And so that's where the name itself came from. Um, so it has um, these strong Southern connections. Nice. Ellenwood being destroyed by fire 
um, and by 1900, and with Thomas Skinker anticipating the World's Fair, um, he chose not to rebuild his Ellenwood, the Ellenwood family estate, um, and instead uh, leased out his land, leased out his property um, for use for the World's Fair. Um, others were doing this as well to try to profit off of um, the exposition. Um, we know that um, uh, Thomas Skinker again leased some of his property. Um, we know that former governor, you know, David Francis um, was president of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition Company. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about David Francis here in a moment. But something that I know many in Clayton are familiar with Clayton history, they often refer to, they refer to um, a connection to the 1904 World's Fair because um, the fair itself, some of the exhibits did uh, make their way into what is Clayton today, even though it was mostly contained in the city of St. Louis and in the park, some of the exhibits did make their way um, into what is Clayton today, like there was a, a beer exhibit um, where you could see some growing um, wheat and or so other things, but um, probably most notable was the Philippine exhibit. And this would have been located where um, the neighborhood of Wydown Terrace is today. Um, and, you know, we, we are, even though St. Louis has often um, built up, you know, the World's Fair, it's kind of this uh, mythic um, event um, that the city has defined itself by. Um, there's been, of course, the movie. Um, I feel like in recent years, and rightly so, we are looking at what happened at the World's Fair with new eyes. Um, and we're looking at those that were exploited um, during the World's Fair. And the Philippine exhibit, unfortunately, is a prime example of that, where um, we have individuals who, who were exploited um, in, this, uh, in this encampment. Um, and so I think that's something that should be considered um, in moving forward of what actually did happen um, to these individuals um, here in Clayton and how they were treated. Um, so Robert S. Brookings, of course, um, as we know, the uh, president of uh, Washington University at the time when it relocated or chose to relocate, he um, put off building the school, you know, because of the World's Fair. He made a little bit of money for the school by leasing um, some of that property to the, for use by the World's Fair before they um, moved into the campus there. Um, but he leased five buildings on the new campus to the exposition, a good business move. But following the World's Fair, after it was closed, this was now when Thomas Skinker reclaimed his land and wanted to develop his property into this fashionable neighborhood um, with so much attention that the World's Fair brought to this area, he wanted to really capitalize on that. And so to lay out this plan for this neighborhood, he hired um, Julius Pitzman, and uh, Skinker bought the first home um, in this development, and it was at 6464 Ellenwood, um, named for the fam family's former plantation home. And this home still stands. It does not look like that Greek Revival plantation home that once stood and burnt down, um, it looks much different now, um, uh, and it has new owners recently. It used to be where um, Sally, uh, Sally Cohn lived, um, but I know it has some, some new owners. But, um, but this home still stands, the home that was rebuilt following the World's Fair. And for a short time, um, uh, David R. Francis lived there as well. So it has a connection to a past Missouri governor, um, and so I know this, this home sometimes, you know, is always a stop when we do historic walking tours, 64, 64 Ellenwood's often a stop on those walking tours for those reasons. And here we see it today, what it would look like today. As I said, it does not resemble those Greek revival um, plantation homes of the past, but it is still, it's meant to be, um, you know, a model of, uh, of an estate of something that Thomas Skinker was trying to achieve with the development of his family's land. 
So Brookings um, supported Skinker's efforts in developing the property. Of course, it would benefit his university to have this fine neighborhood um, right next door. So he himself purchased an estate um, to the west of Skinker's land. And uh, the WashU architect of the time, James Jameson, he designed that home. And that's located at 6510 Ellenwood. Um, uh, today, it's uh, the alumni house um, that you can, um, it's on WashU's campus, but you can see how it was once a part of that same estate. If you were to walk, it's basically at the end of Ellenwood, at the far west of Ellenwood, you can still see the entrance gates to the Brookings estate. And he also purchased some land nearby for his niece and his sister, I believe. Um, but two women who who did not marry, um, two of his family members that did not marry, he purchased homes for them. Um, that, those are in university. So um, Brookings uh, and Skinker worked together to attract business leaders to this new development. Business le leaders like Edward Jones, um, a gentleman from Zernal Flower Company, um, and by the way, to Cecil, if you're wondering in that neighborhood, there is a Cecil Avenue. Cecil was named after the birthplace of Robert Brookings because it's Cecil County in Maryland, if you're wondering where that name comes from. Um, and again, I just go through some of these owners on, um, uh, of some of these homes. Um, but we do have not just business leaders, but those that were conscious of um, you know, of, that were socially conscious. We have um, this woman, Julia Meyer, who knew she was in need of a, a new school for her children um, because they wanted a school based on um, the principles of Montessori. So they started the community school in 1914 for that neighborhood. Um, so the community school um, that was built is now the Wilson School, but you can see how they retain much of the original architecture um, at Wilson School. Of course, they've added on over the years, but they really tried to retain some of that original looks, the original lines of the building um, in, from that original community school, and that is in that same Skinker Heights neighborhood. So he found a lot of difficulty, Skinker did, um, selling the lots along Wydown Boulevard um, because the trolley and all the traffic on the road, it kicked up a lot of dirt and a lot of dust um, and it was noisy. And, um, and so there were some spec homes that were built along Wydown. So um, back then, if you wanted a deal, you could buy a home along Wydown Boulevard. Not, not so today. Um, many of these are out of the outside of the price point of um, the average um, citizen here. So, um, as I said, that's reason why is because of that trolley. But another highlight: there's another great building by James P. Jameson um, in this neighborhood, and that's the uh, Church of St. Michael St. George. It's a beautiful, um, beautifully built uh, church. Um, that you can see today, and you can tell now looking at this and knowing that he was the Wash U architect, you can see a lot of similarities with the architecture of Washington University, the same red um, stone that's used, um, red limestone that's used um, in the construction. Uh, but you can find in here this, I just brought up the monument to the Skinker family that's in Bell Fountain Cemetery, so you can see Again, that name Wydown, um, which uh, was Bertha's um, mother. So you can see her there. Um, and so this is, and it gets confusing. I didn't really go into it, but there's a couple of Thomases. So the Thomas that developed that land and built 6464 Allenwood was actually the son of the attorney who fought um, Forest Park. So, but they were both Thomas. I know people like to reuse names. It can get confusing. Um, but something, again, this was, again, just uh, I wanted to bring up this history in this part of, um, of Clayton because I do find some issue um, with some of this area, and I believe that, you know, it could be addressed by, by this group. Um, a figure that I did not discuss in depth, um, but is a part of the, had a significant part to do with the neighbor 
uh, neighboring district there is um, Henry Wright, um, the um, uh, city planner. Henry Wright, who planned out Demun High Point neighborhood. Um, there is a small pocket park in the Demun High Point neighborhood dedicated to Henry Wright. Um, he um, laid out that neighborhood um, back in the you know early 20th century. Um, would have been just around World War I, around that time period when he would have laid out that neighborhood. And um, Henry Wright received awards for his, his planning. He did um, he really and truly wanted to try to create a neighborhood for everyone. He wanted mixed use um, buildings. He wanted to see apartments um, next to mid-size homes or starter homes, next to larger homes for larger families. He really wanted to see uh, a community develop. He was sure to include retail in his neighborhood that we see along Demun today. Um, the reason he was he did design that Demun High Point neighborhood is because of the trolley that accessed that neighborhood. He he wanted public transportation um, for those that. Uh, needed public transportation. He wanted that to be available. He also intentionally built a church. He wanted a church that everyone could get to if needed, and it was in walking distance. Um, so Henry Wright uh, in the High Point to Mun neighborhood, I know he has a little park to him, but he's also a figure that um, really um, tried his best to develop a, um, a, a real community um, in Clayton. Um, so something that the mayor asked uh, of me is to think of um, uh, problematic names um, and locations um, in the city of Clayton right now that could be really, um, really need, in need of either renaming or reinterpreting. Um, I think sites that could use further um, explanation, could use further education um, to the public. Of course, Jackson Avenue that we've mentioned before, being named after a Confederate general, I feel that um, there is no need in today's, today's world to honor um, an individual. Um, the historic Hanley House, I feel that, um, you know, that is a, a site that definitely could use some reinterpretation. Um, some uh it, it is it's a place and also the name calling it the historic hanley house while you know it's it's easy to easy and memorable to say i think by giving it that title historic hanley you know it's giving some weight giving some um significance to an individual and giving him a place in history um and elevating him so i think that it should be you should consider renaming that site um, because of his uh, connection to um, the Confederacy, his connection to slavery. Um, so that would be a site to be considered for renaming and reinterpreting. Um, Why Down Terrace? Again, because um, of this group of peoples, um, the Philippines, who were really exploited um, during the World's Fair um, and treated almost as if it was a zoological exhibit. Uh, to be frank, um, it was uh, an unfortunate, um, I think, um, piece of the World's Fair. And I feel that that area uh, where it's located today, because you can clearly see where the, um, the gap is in Wydown Terrace, where they would have filled the ponds, where they would have placed the raised homes um, for the exhibit. It could be a, um, a great opportunity for um, reinterpretation. Um, Ellenwood, uh, the reason I put Ellenwood here, I know it's a, uh, it sounds like a very charming street, but to know it was named after a plantation, um, and a plantation home, I, I think that that is a troublesome street, um, because of that history. And then from Ellenwood, from Skinker, of course, the Skinker family named, um, Alexander Drive after, um, one of their children. Again, I don't want to fault the children for the sins of their fathers. Um, Alexander was just a child of the second Thomas Skinker. So, um, you know, but I did want to bring that up where that name came from. And also the county, um, Falkworth County in Virginia. 
Um, the family was very, the Skinker family was very proud of their Virginia heritage, their Virginia roots, um, and the slave owning tradition. So that should be considered um, in that street's name. Um, I've also talked with um, the mayor and some others about some of the guard houses that you'll see in Clayton in some of the Clayton neighborhoods as they were developed in the 20th century. Um, I, you know, there are several of them, but one in particular I know is the guard house on Somerset, which is at the Wydown neighborhood. It's right off of the Clayton Road. Um, and many of these guard houses, I feel, um, you know, their primary purpose, of course, was to... Um, keep those out, those that were unsavory out of these neighborhoods. Um, as we, you know, and many of that, you know, was many of these folks were racially profiled. Um, there are instances where many of these guards had specific instructions. They would follow if they saw an African American, they would follow them. They would report if they saw someone living in an apartment building who was not of the right color. Um, so again, some of these guard houses, I think, played an unsavory part in um, the controlling of these neighborhoods and those that could live there. Wydown Boulevard, again, it has connection to the Southern family with these Southern traditions um, that were brought here to, um, to Clayton. Uh, then the public transportation shelters that are along Wydown Boulevard, I think they are beautiful. And they are wonderful, but I think they also tell the story of those that had to take that public transportation, had to take the trolley for work in Clayton. Many of them were the domestic servants who worked in many of the mansions alongside Wydown Boulevard. Think of the um, Brent, Moore, uh, Brent Moore Park um, neighborhoods. Um, so many of those domestic servants um, uh, who had to take that trolley to get out here for work, they would have used those shelters. Um, and every time I drive by them, I think of who would have been standing under them waiting for the trolley. So I, I just thought that that could be a, a space that could be um, ripe for interpretation. Um, and then, as I said, Henry Wright Park, I, I, I think there's a, there's a small plaque that's there, a small um, uh, it's kind of similar to what, what the Crispus Attics uh, Memorial looks like now, where it is a, um, like a bronze plaque on top of a small stone plinth. It's similar to that. So I think Henry Bright Park, Park and celebrating what he did to create a diverse community um, or try to um, could be something that um, is, uh, is, again, reinterpreted and, and looked at a little bit closer. So... That is what I have for you guys today. And I wanted to, I didn't want to take up too much time because I know that Mayor Harris would also like for us, and I'm gonna stop my share right now and, and hand it over to, to Mayor Harris, because I know that you, you were hoping to also um, look at um, process um, and, and moving forward. So I'll give up my, my mic. And, and I think you're still muted too, Mayor. Sorry about that, folks. Um, right, Sarah, thank you. That was great. Um, I think there's, you know, we can always dig deeper on each of these individuals or um, neighborhoods, but it gives us a little bit of an overview. And the list is great, Sarah. I appreciate